in his classic novel of revenge and retribution. Alexandre Dumas brought to life the horrors of an island prison in the Bay of Marseille, a prison in which two jailers are preparing for a burial at sea. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Dramatized for radio in seven episodes by Barry Campbell. Part three The Return. Starring Andrew Sachs as Edmond Dantes, Paul Gregory as Caderousse, and Leslie Sands as Monsieur Morel. Betrayed by those he thought to be his friends, Edmond Dantes spent 14 years in the dungeons of the notorious Chateau d'If. Having escaped by taking the place of the dead Abbe Faria, Dantes has succeeded in recovering the fabulous treasure of Monte Cristo. Now, in disguise, he begins to seek those who caused him to be imprisoned. Come in, Your Reverence. You do come in. Thank you. It's an honour to receive you under my poor roof. Ah. You are Monsieur Caderousse, the innkeeper? <laughs> Gaspard Caderousse. Yeah, at your service. And you once lived in the Allée de Maillon in Marseille, on the fourth floor of a house there? Oh, that's true. But, but that was over 20 years ago. I was a tailor until trade dropped off. <laughs> but please, do come in out of the heat. Thank you. Oh, oh that, that's better. Is there anything I can get you, sir? Oh, some wine, I think. Oh, yes, monsieur. Perhaps you would care to join me. As you please, monsieur l'abbé. Ah, oh, there we are. Sit here. Good. It's quite comfortable. Yes. Thank you. Now, um, you live quite alone here. Except for my wife uh, oh. and the stable boy. You are married, then? <laughs> yes. Mm. Well, to business. First of all, I must be satisfied that you are the person I've been searching for. Searching for? Well, I, well, I don't be patient. Quite... It could be to your advantage. Tell me, did you, in the year 1814 or 1815, know anything of a young sailor named Edmond Dantes? Oh, poor... Dear Edmond, why, we were good friends. Tell me, is he alive and well? No. No, he died, a wretched, heartbroken prisoner. Oh, poor Edmond. I'm sorry to hear it. You speak as though you loved this Dantes. Oh, so I did. Though once, I confess, I envied him his good fortune, but I swear that I have since then sincerely lamented his unhappy fate. Did you know him? Um, alas, no. No. Um, I am the Abbe Busoni. I, I was called to see him when he was dying. But the strange thing is that even in his last moments, he swore that he was ignorant of the cause of his imprisonment. And so he was. 
He told you the truth. And for that reason, he asked me to try to clear up a mystery he had never been able to solve. It seems that um, someone who had been his companion in misfortune owned a diamond of immense value. A diamond? But, uh, yes, I don't... well, this diamond he gave to Dantes as a mark of his gratitude. Dantes had nursed him through a severe illness, it seems. Yes, 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 yes. But, but what has this got to do with me? Well, have patience. Now, Dantes kept the jewel in the hope that when he was eventually released, he would have something to live on. But now, poor fellow, he's dead. A diamond of immense value, you say? It was estimated at 50,000 francs. My God. God, it must have been as big as a walnut. Indeed. Judge for yourself. <gasps> oh, that's, that's magnificent. Oh, but how, how came this diamond to be in your possession? Did Edmore make you his heir? No, no. When he, when he was dying, he said to me, um, I once had four dear and faithful friends. I'm sure they have all grieved over me. These friends were called Caderousse, Dangla, and Fernand. And there was also a girl. Mercedes. You're right. It was Mercedes. <sighs> <coughs> oh, yes, forgive me. <clears throat> Where was I? Yes, well then said Dantes, uh, you will go to Marseille, uh, sell this diamond, and divide the profit into five equal parts, uh, giving a share to the only persons who loved me on earth. Five parts? But you only mentioned four people. Yes, the fifth person is dead. Dante's father. Of course. Or well, the poor old man died. Yes, so I learnt at Marseille. But I was unable to obtain any particulars relating to his death. Perhaps you yes, could enlighten... Yes, yes, yes. It was about a year after Dante's arrest that the old man died. What did he die of? <laughs> the doctors called his complaint an internal inflammation. <laughs> but I say that he died of... Yes? Of starvation. S starvation? Yes. Oh! Oh, that a man, a Christian, should be allowed to die of hunger in the midst of other Christians. It's, it's too horrible to believe. And what I have said, I have said... And you are a fool for having oh. said anything about it. Ah. Why should you meddle with what does not concern oh. you? Mind your own business, wife! This gentleman asked me for information which common politeness will not permit me to refuse. Oh, Simpleton, how do you know what motive this man may have for trying to extract all he can from you? Dad. Oh, it's easy to begin with fair promises and assurances of nothing to fear, but when simpletons like my husband have been persuaded to tell all they know, the promises are quickly forgotten. Madame, you have nothing to fear from me. But continue, Carderousse. Dante's father was forsaken by everyone? Not altogether forsaken, monsieur. For Mercedes and Monsieur Morel were both kind to him, but somehow the old fellow contracted a powerful hatred of the fisherman Fernand, the very person you named as being one of Dante's friends. And was he not so? Gaspard, mind what you are saying. Oh, can a man be faithful to another whose betrothed he covets? Poor Edmond, he was cruelly deceived. And, and, and do you know how this... Um... This Fernand injured Dante? No, I do. Gaspard, be guided by me. Say nothing. Wife, you're right. Now I shall follow your advice. Oh. So you prefer, then, that I should bestow upon this false friend the reward intended for faithful friendship? Very well. I must go. No, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. Please, please, wait. You are right. The gift of poor Edmond was not meant for such traitors as Fernand and Danglar. Besides, what would it mean to him? Nothing. A drop in the ocean. Careful, husband. You could make yourself two formidable enemies. Are these persons then so rich and powerful? Don't you know their history? Pray relate it to me. Oh, it would take too long. Caderousse, you are at liberty to speak or to be silent. I shall do my duty and fulfil my promise to a dying man. My first task will be to sell this. Huh? See how it shines. Wife, 
Come here and look at this diamond. What diamond? This one. Oh, it is indeed a splendid stone. And a fifth part of its value belongs to us. No, indeed, a fourth part, now that old Dantes is dead. It must be shared amongst his four friends. I don't call them friends who betray and ruin a man. Nor do I. Four shares. <laughs> well, perhaps you will have the goodness to give me the present addresses of Fernand, Mercedes and Danglars so that I might carry out Edmond's last wish. Oh, do as you like. I'm going back upstairs. Oh, this gentleman is a priest. He would not deceive us. Oh, I warn you. Consider carefully what you are about to do. Yes, yes, yes. Well, what are you going to do, monsieur? To... to tell you all I know. Hmm. You act wisely in doing so. But first, uh, another glass. Uh, well, Caderousse? Well, first... You must promise me that if you ever make use of the information I'm about to give you, you'll never tell anyone it was me that supplied it, for the persons I'm going to talk about are rich and powerful men. I promise. Well, when Dantes was arrested, his old father returned home alone. The next day, Mercedes visited him, and when she saw him so miserable, she wanted to take him home with her to look after him. No, was the old man's reply. I will not leave this house, for my poor boy loves me, and if he gets out of prison, he will come here. What would he think if I didn't wait for him? I heard all this from my window. Oh? Hmm. You did not go upstairs to try to console the old man? Oh, sir, we cannot console those who will not be consoled. Well, at length, and convinced that his son was dead, the poor old fellow reached the end of his resources. He owed rent, and our landlord threatened to evict him. Then I resolved to go up to him, no matter what. His door was closed. Well, I looked through the keyhole, and believing him to be ill, I ran and told Monsieur Morel and Mercedes. They came at once. Monsieur Morel brought a doctor. Mercedes wanted him to go to the hospital, but he refused. At last, the old fellow died, saying, If you ever see my Edmore again, tell him I died blessing him. <sighs> then Monsieur Morel went away, making a sign that he'd left his purse on the mantel shelf. Well, this money paid for the burial. Abbe. <clears throat> and you believe he died? Of hunger. I'm sure of it. It was indeed an awful business. All the more so, sir, since it was men's and not God's doing. Who are these men who killed the son with despair and the father with famine? Two men, jealous of him. One from love, the other from ambition. Fernand and Donglar. They denounced Edmond as a Bonapartist agent. One wrote a letter and the other delivered it. The letter was written at a cafe the day before Edmond's betrothal party. Ah, oh, Faria, Faria, how well did you judge men and things? Sorry, I, I didn't quite... No, uh, uh, go on with your story. Well, it was Donglar who wrote the letter. He disguised his writing by using his left hand. Fernand delivered it. And you were there yourself to no, know this? I was there. And yet you did not attempt to stop them? You were an accomplice. Abbe, believe me, they had made me drink to such an excess. I did not fully understand what was happening. Besides, they assured me it was only a harmless jest. But the next day, when Dantes was arrested, you must have realized that it was far from being a jest. And yet you still said nothing. I was there. I wanted to speak out, but Donglar stopped me. It was cowardly, I confess, but not criminal. Hmm. You mentioned a Monsieur Morel. Who was he? Dante's employer, owner of the ship, Farron. Yes. What part did he play in this sad drama? The part of an honest man. Twenty times he interceded for Edmond. Ten times he called to see Dante's father, even offered to lodge him in his own home. And on the night of his death, as I told you, 
Monsieur Morel left his purse on old Dante's mantel shelf. Ah, oh, I've got it still. A large one, made of red silk. Is this Monsieur Morel still alive? Oh, yes. But he's in a bad way. Oh? Mm, I hear that he is at the point of ruin. How can this be? He's lost five ships in two years. His only hope now is the Pharaoh, expected from India. Has he any family? A wife and a daughter, Julie. He also has a son, Maximilian, a lieutenant in the army. Well, poor Monsieur Morel. I think that if he were alone in the world, he'd blow his brains out. And it's thus that heaven rewards virtue. <laughs> and all the time, Fernand and Danglars are rolling in wealth. What became of Danglars? On Monsieur Morel's recommendation, he was taken on as a cashier in a Spanish bank. But well, during the war with Spain, he made a fortune. He's a millionaire. Baron Danglars. Where does he live? Rue de Montblanc, Paris. Good. And the other man, the fisherman? Uh, Fernand. He too has both fortune and high position. Incredible. <laughs> but true. When Napoleon returned, Fernand was forced to join the army. He was at the Battle of Ligny. But the night after the battle, he deserted in the company of a general and went over to the English. Well, had Napoleon remained on the throne, he'd have been court-martialed. <laughs> As things turned out, he was a hero. Eventually, he became a colonel, received the title of Comte Fernand de Morcef. Oh, destiny, destiny. But that's not all. Oh. Oh. Well, after the war with Spain ended, Fanon served in Greece. Then he entered the service of Ali Tebelen, Pasha of Yanina. Well, the Pasha was killed, but he left Fanon a considerable sum of money. He too must be a millionaire. And his address? Rue du Elde, Paris. Good. You've done well. But, um, what of Mercedes? They tell me that she has disappeared. <laughs> disappeared? Why, Mercedes is at this very moment one of the greatest ladies in Paris. Oh? Mm, she is the Comtesse de Morcerf. Eighteen months after Dante's arrest, she married Fernand. Eighteen months? Oh, frailty, thy name is woman. Soon after the wedding, they left Marseille. Fernand was a lieutenant of the army by then. Did you ever see her again? Yes, once. During the war at Perpignan, she was attending to the education of her son. Her son? Mm, little Albert Morcerf. <laughs> Mercedes. She's now a rich countess. <laughs> Life's a funny thing. One more question. What, um, what of Monsieur de Villefort? Uh, the deputy prosecutor? Yeah, he was never a friend of mine. No doubt he's been as lucky as the rest. Only I, as you see, have remained poor and, and forgotten. No. No, you're mistaken. And behold, a proof. Here, take the diamond. It is yours. For me only? Oh, oh sir, do, do not jest with me. Uh -huh. Edmore had one friend only. Take it and sell it. It is worth 50,000 francs. And in exchange... In exchange? Give me the red silk purse that Monsieur Morel left at old Dante's house. Oh, gladly. It is here. Now, where could I put that? Ah! Here it is. Oh, you're a man of God, sir. Monsieur Cadrus, all you have told me is perfectly true. Oh, I swear it. Tis well. And may the money profit you. Here, take the diamond. Oh, thank you, sir. And now, adieu. I go far from men who thus so bitterly injure each other. The gentleman I spoke of to see you, Monsieur Morel. Thank you, Cockley. That will be all. 
And so, you wish to speak to me on a matter of some importance, monsieur? Yes, sir. You are aware from whom I have come? The House of Thompson and French of Rome, I believe. Quite so. The House of Thompson and French have collected all the bills bearing your signature and charged me to present them. They amount to 287,500 francs. 287,500. I will not conceal from you, Monsieur Morel, that while your probity and exactitude are, up to this moment, universally acknowledged, yet rumour has it that you are not now able to meet your obligations. Sir, up to this time never has anything bearing the signature of Morel and Son been dishonoured. Yes, I know that. But as one man of honour should answer another, tell me fairly, will you pay these bills with the same punctuality? Two questions fairly put. A straightforward answer should be given. Yes, I shall pay. If, as I hope, my vessel arrives safely from India. Good. But if the pharaon is lost, then... then I shall be forced to suspend my payments. And you have but the one hope? And if that fails, I am ruined. As I came here, a vessel was entering port. Ah, yes, La Gironde. It comes from India also, but alas, it is not mine. Julie! Julie, my dear! Father, bad news. The foul. Lost? Yes, Father. And and the crew? Julie, what of the crew? Saved. Saved by La Gironde. Oh, thank God. Here is the pen and law to see you. If, if you will excuse me, sir. Of course. Come in, Penelon. Thank you, sir. Now, how did this happen? Where is your captain? The captain stayed behind sick at Palmer, sir. We did everything we could to save the ship. I know you did, Penelon. It was a gale that did for us, somewhere off Cap Long. We tried to save her, but it was no use. At last, we was forced to take to the boats just before she went down, sir. We was three days in the boats... Then we sighted La Gironde. She picked us up. We did everything we could to save her, sir. Father. Thank you, Penelon. But tell me, what wages are due to you and the others? Oh, don't let's talk of that, sir. We must. Well, then, sir, it's uh, three months. Julie, my dear, arrange for the cashier to pay these poor fellows 200 francs each. Yes, Father. As to that, sir, well, we all say 50 will be enough to be going on with. Thank you, but please take what is due to you. And if you can find another employer, then you are all free to do so. What? Do you want to send us away? Are you angry with us? No, of course I'm not angry. But I have no more ships. Then we'll wait till you build some, sir. Please, I must ask you to leave me now. We shall meet again soon. Meanwhile, I have matters to discuss with this gentleman. Come along now, Penelon. Uh, yes, miss. Good day, Monsieur Morel. Good day, sir. Bye, Penelon. Good day. Well, sir, now you have heard all. Mm. It is finished. As a representative of Thompson and French... I am one of your largest creditors, am I not? Your bills are the first to fall due. Do you wish for time to pay? A delay would save my honour. Good. How long do you wish for? Two months? Sir. I will give you three. Oh, but, sir, I never... No, 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 no. Today I... is the 5th of June. Very well. Renew the bills until September. On the 5th of September, at 11 o'clock, I shall come to receive the money. Sir, I thank you. I shall expect you... And I will pay you, or I shall be dead. Oh, oh I'm, I'm sorry, sir. I, d I did not see you. Mademoiselle, listen to me. One day you will receive a letter signed um, uh, Sinbad the Sailor. What? Uh, do exactly what that letter bids you, however strange it may appear. Sinbad the Sailor? Yes. Is this a joke, sir? Do exactly what the letter bids you, for your father's sake. Do you promise? I promise. It is well. Adieu, mademoiselle. Excuse me, miss, but uh, me and the lads will say goodbye now. Oh. Uh, no, not goodbye yet, Penelon. Sir? Come with me, my friend. There are things I wish to discuss with you. Father! Oh, 
Was your journey to Paris successful? It was very tiring, my dear. And that was all. Oh, but surely you... Baron Danglars will not pass his word for a loan. But that is not possible. Danglars is worth millions, and if it wasn't for you, he would still be a clerk. It is God's will, my dear. But if you'll excuse me, I must go to my office. Oh, won't you rest for a while first? You look so tired. Alas, I have no time left. And there is much to do. Julie, I came as soon as I got your letter. Maximilian, thank God. What has happened? Dear brother, we are ruined. Ruined? But how? Why? Today is settlement day with Thompson and French. We cannot meet our obligations. Morel and son will be declared bankrupt. Oh, my God, I had no idea. Excuse me, Miss Julie. This letter came for you. Letter? Quickly, let me see. Where's my... Where you... Send back the sailor. So he was in earnest. Thank you, Marie. Yes, yes. What's it say? Oh, listen, listen. Um, go this moment to the Allée de Mayor. Enter house number 15. Ask the porter for the key of the room on the fifth floor. Enter the apartment. Take from the corner of the mantelpiece a red silk purse and give it to your father. It is important that he should receive it before 11 o'clock. Remember your promise, Sinbad the Sailor. What does it mean? Who is this Sinbad oh, the Sailor? Then, there's no time to explain. I must go at once. But suppose there is danger. Let me come with you. No, you must go to father. He needs you. I don't think he should be left alone for too long. Father, Julie said I was... Why, what's this? What is that pistol for? Maximilian, you are a man of honour. Come, I will explain. Today is the 5th of September. At 11 o'clock, I have to pay the agent of Thompson and French almost 300,000 francs. I do not have it. But you have no money to come in? None. And you have exhausted every possible source? Yes. Then in half an hour, our name will be dishonoured? Blood washes out dishonour. I understand, Father. Two pistols? No. No. Your mother and sister. Who would support them? Are you bidding me to live? It is your duty. Very well, Father. I will live. You know none of this is my fault. I know that you are the most honourable man I have ever met. <laughs> Thank you, my boy. And now, all is said. Go to your mother and sister. Father, must it... Hush now. Go to your mother. As you wish, Father. And tell Cockley that when the gentleman from Thompson and French comes, he is to announce his arrival to me. Yes, Father. It is almost time. So be it. Father, we are saved. Saved! Julie, saved? But... Look saved. here, in this purse. A receipted uh, bill for 300,000 uh, francs and this uh, diamond and a note. See, it says Julie's dowry. Purse, but where did you get this purse? In the Allée Meilleur, number 15, on the mantelpiece of a small room on the fifth floor. Uh, number 15? Old Dante's room. Monsieur Morel! Miss Julie! Monsieur Morel! What is it? What's the matter? The Pharaon! The Pharaon! Uh, Are you mad? The Pharaon is lost. Sir, sir, they are signalling Pharaon entering harbour. Oh. This is a miracle. A miracle. Oh, Father. Quickly, everyone, to the harbour. Quickly. Be happy, noble heart. Be blessed for all the good you have done and will do hereafter. Oh, how it pleases me to be able to reward you with riches and a new pharaoh. And now, farewell kindness and gratitude. I have rewarded the good. Now, I go to punish the wicked.
Santa wines, gentlemen. Plenty. Ah, excellent. A buys for a carriage. <laughs> Impossible. There is no wine to be had in the all of Rome. Come, Maitre Pastrini, no jokey. We must have a carriage for the carnival. My dear Vicard de Morcerf, I will do everything in my power to procure you one. That is all I can say. No carriage for the carnival? Well, your eternal city is a devilish nice place. My father shall hear of this. Oh, no, no, uh, please, uh, don't trouble Count Fernand de Morcerf. Uh, what I meant was, uh, there are no carriages to be had from Sunday to Tuesday evening. Deuce! Uh, but from now until Sunday, you may have fifty, if you please. Well, that is something, eh, France? Let's go on to Venice at once, Albert. No, I came to Rome to see the carnival, and I will, though I see it on stilts. Do your excellencies still wish for a carriage from now till Sunday morning? Of course! Do you think we're going to run about the streets like lawyers' clerks? We require a carriage tonight at eight o'clock precisely. We intend to visit the Colosseum and then to drive round the walls of the city. But such a thing is impossible. Impossible? But very dangerous, to say the least. The bandit Luigi Vampa is abroad. Well, what has that got to do with it? Besides, I've already decided we leave the city by the Porte di Popolo and re-enter it by the Porte San Giovanni. Well, Excellency, you may well go out by one, but I very much doubt if you will return by the other. Why? Because after nightfall, you are not safe, 50 meters from the gates. My dear France, here's an admirable adventure. Let us fill the carriage with pistols, and when the bandit, uh, Vampa, comes to take us... We take him. But your excellency knows it's not customary to defend yourself when attacked by bandits. What? Not put up a fight? No, for he will be useless. What can you do against a dozen armed bandits who suddenly sprang out at you? Well, I'd never surrender. With respect, excellency, your friend is decidedly mad. Tell us more about this vampire. He is very daring, and much too clever for the authorities to capture. The police have tried many times without success to trap him. And how does he behave towards travellers? Ah, oh, his plan is very simple. It depends on the distance he may be from the city, whether he gives eight or twelve hours or a day, wherein his victims may pay their ransom. And when that time has elapsed, he allows one hour's grace, and then, pa, blows their brains out. My God. Well, Albert, are you still disposed to visit the Colosseum? More than ever. Pastrini, have the carriage ready at eight. But first, supper. I am starved. Come along, France. You're flagging. I'm afraid I am. I had no notion that there was so much to see. Nor had I. How large and foreboding it all looks by moonlight. But do hurry, the guide is waiting. Look, you go on. I'll stay here and get my breath back. Join me when you return. If you're quite certain. Of course. I shall sit here and enjoy the spectacle without the chatter of our guide. <laughs> As you please. But don't stray too far. Remember Major Pastrini's warning and watch out for bandits. What the devil? Can't be Albert so soon. More travellers? No, too quiet. Perhaps it would be as well to retire into the shadows. One never knows. Excellency, is that you? Yes, I'm here. I beg your Excellency's pardon for keeping you waiting. No, no, it is I who am too soon, Vampa. Now, what have you learnt? that two executions of considerable interest will take place the day after tomorrow, as is customary in Rome at the commencement of all great festivals. One of the culprits will be uh, Mazzolato. Mazzolato? Uh, the throat cut. And the other? Is to be guillotined. It is Peppino, who I am determined to rescue. Indeed. What do you intend to do? <laughs> to surround the scaffold with twenty of my men, who, at a signal from me, will drive back the guard and carry off the prisoner. That seems to me to be both hazardous and uncertain. Mm -hmm. No, I have a far better plan than yours. I will arrange a last-minute reprieve. But, Excellency... Oh, I... Believe me, I can do more single-handed by means of gold than you with all your troop could effect with stilettos and carbines. I see, but uh, how would I know whether Your Excellency has succeeded or not? Uh, let me see now. 
Yes. I have engaged three lower windows at the Palazzo Rospoli. When I have obtained Peppino's pardon, the two outside windows will be hung with yellow damask and the centre one with white. Ah, Your Excellency, you are fully persuaded of my devotion to you, are you not? Of course. France? Who's that? Some travellers visiting the Coliseum by moonlight, perhaps. Yes, we must not be seen together. Adieu. Very well. And uh, if you fail to obtain the reprieve... Well, in that unlikely event, all three windows at the Palazzo Rospoli will have yellow draperies, and then you may use your daggers in any way you please. Ah, then all is understood between us. Yes. Adieu, Your Excellency. Adieu. Depend upon me as firmly as I depend upon you. Are you all right? Here. Over here, Albert. I'm quite safe. Why, so you are. Well, what have you been up to? I, I thought I'd lost you. Indeed, I was beginning to think that you had been kidnapped by bandits after all. <laughs> I fear I almost was. What? Come. The night grows cold. Let's return to the hotel or we shall be late for the opera. Quite magnificent, wonderful. Hmm. Ah. And now, my dear Countess, do you happen to know the identity of the young lady in the box opposite? Oh, such gallantry, shame on you, friends. She is unusual, is she not? Very, very beautiful. <laughs> All I can tell you is that she's been in Rome since the beginning of the season, and she's yet to miss an opera performance. Sometimes she's accompanied by the individual who is with her tonight, and at other times by an immense black servant. At a guess, I should say that she is Greek. And the gentleman with her? Who is he? Right. I know no more of him than you do. Her husband, perhaps. Oh, no, she is but a girl. All I can say is that the gentleman whose history I am unable to furnish looks to me as though he's just been dug up. <laughs> truly. <laughs> really? Truly, he looks like a corpse, permitted by some friendly grave digger to quit his tomb for a while. How ghastly pale he is. I must positively find out who and what he is. Excuse me. No, you must not leave me. I depend upon you to escort me home. Is it possible that you're afraid of that man, Countess? I will tell you. Lord Byron had the most perfect belief in vampires and even assured me he had seen some. Well, the description he gave me perfectly corresponds with the features and character of that man opposite. Cold black hair, large, bright, glittering eyes, the same ghastly paleness. Then observe, too, the very female he has with him. Nobody knows who she is or where she comes from. No doubt she belongs to the same horrible race as he does, and is, like himself, a dealer in magical arts. Now, Franz, I entreat you not to go near him. At least, not tonight. Oh, but my dear Countess... Listen to me. I am going home at once. Now, I cannot believe you so devoid of gallantry as to refuse to escort a lady when she asks you to. Very well, Countess. I will accompany you. France! Why, I did not expect to see you before tomorrow. My dear Albert, I'm glad of this opportunity to tell you once and forever that you entertain a most erroneous notion concerning Italian ladies. I should have thought that the continual failures you've met with in all your own love affairs might have taught you better by this time. <laughs> yes? Excellencies, 
I bring good news. Well, Pastrini, out with it. Your excellencies are aware that the Conte di Monte Cristo is living on the same floor as yourself. I should think we are, since that is the reason for our being packed into these small rooms like two poor students in the back streets of Paris. Well, then, the Conte, hearing of the dilemma in which you are placed, has sent to offer you seats in his carriage and two places at his windows in the Palazzo Rospoli for the carnival. Rospoli? But this is excellent news, Pastrini. But do you think that we ought to accept such an offer from a perfect stranger? What sort of person is this Count? A very great nobleman. Well, then please convey our thanks to the Count of Monte Cristo for his most generous offer and inform him that we shall be delighted to call upon him tomorrow so that we may thank him in person, eh, Albert? Of course. Ah, gentlemen, yes, forgive me for not coming to your assistance earlier. It was the fault of that blockhead Pastrini. He did not mention your embarrassment to me until last night when I returned from the opera. We have to thank you a thousand times, oh, Count. No. Yes, you've kindly offered us places in your carriage and at your windows at the Palazzo Rospoli. Oh. Can you tell us where we can obtain a sight of the Piazza del Popolo? Ah, is there not something like an execution there? So I understand. Mm. My steward, the good Bertuccio, has procured me some windows overlooking the very place. Oh. Perhaps you would care to join me. But we abuse your kindness. Oh, no, not at all. It will give me the greatest of pleasure, I assure you, my dear Vicomte de Morcerf. The greatest of pleasure. Ah, oh. it will begin soon. The first will be mazzolato, the second guillotined. At least it was originally arranged this way. However, mention was made of something like a pardon for one of the two men. You may thus be deprived of seeing a man guillotined. The other punishment, however, is a very curious and interesting one when seen for the first time. Hmm. Ah. Huh? At last. Something is happening in the square below. France, the prisoners are being brought out. I thought you said there was to be only one execution. Well, so there is. But there are two prisoners. Yes, but only one is about to die. See there? Huh? Something's happening? Uh. Well, it looks as if Peppino is to be spared after all. Yes, he's being led away. The other prisoner looks very angry. No, oh, he's clearly not to enjoy the same leniency. Well, you're to be spared the decapitation, my friends. Thank God for that. But not the Mazzolata. I see. Huh? Executioner? He's beginning with the other man. I... I cannot watch. I, I, I must go. No, 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 no. Stay. Do you pity a man who murdered his benefactor? Stay. Look. You must look. Ah, no. They've no. opened the throat. And now... No. Ah. No. Oh. Ah. My dear myself. It is finished. But it seems your friend has no stomach for such things. <sighs> what? what? What's happened? You fainted, that's all. I remember it. Oh, it was horrible. But, but did you see Monte Cristo standing there like, like an avenging angel? And did you notice how he looked at you, Albert? Come, you are still light-headed. Rest a while. Ah, our young friend has recovered his senses. I'm glad of it. Yes, and that horrible scene has passed away like a, a nightmare. Well, now, do you feel strong enough to join the revels? Revels? Hmm. But, uh, the carnival has begun. Oh, yes, of course. I remember. Yes, yes, let, let's go. Anything to help me forget that horrible sight. Yes, and come along. Make haste and dress yourselves in carnival costumes. You will find everything you need in the next room. Hurry! You must not miss it. The whole of Rome joins in the dance. <laughs> Did you see that? What is it, Albert? A beautiful girl. She threw flowers at me. Look! 
<laughs> Magnificent! This could be the beginning of an adventure for you. Laugh if you please, but I really think it is. There! See, she is waving to me! Bravo! France! Ah, at last! Where have you been out there? I never knew anyone with such a capacity for enjoyment. Oh. I confess that I am utterly exhausted. And so am I, my dear fellow. But listen, it is done. It is arranged. What is done? You remember the girl who threw flowers at me this morning? Yes. Well, we have a rendezvous. Never. Never? Then read that. Tuesday evening at seven o'clock, descend from your carriage opposite the Via dei Pontifici and follow the Roman peasant who signals to you. You see, she will still be in peasant costume. When you arrive at the church of San Giacomo, fasten a knot of rose-coloured ribbon to your costume, hmm. signed, Constancy and Discretion. Now, what do you think of that? Well, I think that your adventure is progressing. I think so, too. <laughs> Take care that you do not become too much involved with this mysterious charmer, Albert. Remember, your father intends you to marry Mademoiselle Danglars. Oh, laugh as much as you like. I don't care. I am in love. Oh, France, I am in love. And so you have let poor Albert go rushing off to God knows where to meet God knows who. Nothing could have stopped him, Countess. He is demented. He is in love. Oh, Franz, you should not have allowed him to go. Oh, but what could possibly happen to him? Who can tell? The night is very gloomy. Oh, and that reminds me. It seems that you and Albert... Here at this hour, have you come to take supper with me? Ah, Count... I've come to speak to you of a serious matter. Indeed? A serious matter? Please read this, Count. Oh, very well. <clears throat> if 4,000 piastres are not in my hands by 7 o'clock, the Vicomte Albert de Morcerf will have ceased to exist. Luigi Vampa! Hmm, I see. This is serious indeed. Have you the money he demands? All but 800 piastres. <gasps> Well, I, I hope you will not offend me by applying to anyone but me. On the contrary, I, I came to you first and instantly. Oh, good. But is it absolutely necessary to send this money to Vampa? Just for yourself. The note is explicit. But I think, sir, that you could find a way of simplifying the negotiations. I'm sure that Vampa would not refuse you poor Albert's freedom. Uh, why? What do you mean? Well, did not you save the criminal Peppino's life? Now, who told you that, I wonder? No matter. Oh. <sighs> Very well. So be it. <clears throat> How did this letter get to you? A man brought it. He's downstairs now. He waits for an answer. Ah, let us go to him at once. Careful, Excellencies. Yes. The ground slopes here. Oh, keep close to me. Yes. How much further, Peppino? Ah, we are nearly there. Oh, damn it! Quietly! Who is there? We are betrayed! Oh. To arms! Oh. Quickly! To oh, arms! Stand still. Stay close to me. Stop up there! Well, my dear Vampa, it appears to me that you receive a friend with a deal of ceremony. Lower your arms, man! Mm. Oh. Your pardon, Conte. I did not recognize you in the half-light. Well, it seems that your memory is equally short in everything, Vampa. Not only do you forget people's faces, but also the conditions you make with them. Was it not agreed that not only my person, but also that of my friends, should be respected by you? But how have I broken our treaty, Excellency? Why, this very evening you have carried off the Vicomte Albert de Morcelf, one of my friends. And what is more, you have set a price upon him. Why was I not told of this? I have been made to break my word mm. towards the Count. Yes. By heaven, if I thought any one of you knew that our prisoner was a friend of His Excellency, I would blow his brains out. But where is the Vicomte? I do not see him. Nothing has happened to him, I hope. The uh, prisoner is over there. I will go myself and set him free. Good. Uh, follow me, please. Yes. Excellent. This way, Franz. Come along. Why, 
<laughs> he sleeps like a baby. Albert, Albert, wake up, wake up. Mm. Oh, what's this? Oh, I had such a delightful dream. I was dancing with the Countess. Oh, but it's still dark outside. But what the devil? Albert, you're free. Friends. You paid the ransom? No ransom. A person to whom I can refuse nothing has come to demand you. France? No, Albert. The Count of Monte Cristo. What? My dear Count, forgive me. I, I did not see you there in the shadows. You really are most kind. Oh, not at all. I not trust Albert. that you will consider me eternally obliged to you. My dear Albert, if you make haste, we shall just have time to finish the night of the ball. <laughs> you may conclude your dance with the Countess. <laughs> <laughs> Signor Vampa, I thank you. You have acted like a gentleman in this affair. Oh, uh, Peppino, give me a torch. Uh, gentlemen, I will show you the way back myself. That is the least honor I can render your excellency after making such a dreadful mistake. Uh, come then, gentlemen. Follow me, please. Come, Mr. Albert. Count. Permit me to repeat the poor thanks I offered you last night. Oh. I owe you my life. If I or my family can serve you in any way at all, you have only to ask. My father, the Comte Fernand de Morcerf, possesses considerable influence at both the courts of France and Madrid. Monsieur Albert, your generous offer is precisely what I should have expected. Oh. And I accept it in the same spirit of sincerity with which it is made. No, I will go further still, and say that I had previously made up my mind to ask you a great favour. Oh, pray, name it. In three months I shall be visiting Paris. I am a stranger there. It's a city I have never yet seen. Therefore, I have to ask you whether you would consider introducing me into the fashionable circles of Parisian society uh, when I get there. With the greatest pleasure. Ah. Indeed, I am to return to Paris at once. Only this morning I received a letter from my father which summons me home in consequence of a treaty of marriage. Indeed. <laughs> Who knows? Perhaps by the time you reach the city I shall already be a staid and sober husband. <laughs> but as regards your wish, nothing would give me or my family greater pleasure. And um, your mother? Madame Mercedes de Morcerf? We'll be delighted to meet you. Of that I am quite sure. Then it is settled. I shall call at your house in Paris. Please do. It is 27 Rue de Hmm. Well, today is the 21st of February. It is exactly half past ten. Expect me then on the 21st of May at the same hour. Capital. You shall find everything and everybody ready to receive you. Good. When do you intend to leave Rome? Uh, tomorrow evening. So soon? And your friend Franz, uh, does he also depart tomorrow? Yes, for Venice. He um, intends to remain in Italy for a year or so. Ah, and I am compelled to leave at once for Naples. Allow me to wish you a safe and pleasant journey. It is agreed, then. Indeed it is. Rely upon seeing me at the time and place arranged. Number 27, Rue du LD, on May the 21st at half past ten in the morning. We meet in Paris. <laughs>